going to focus uh, a lot on what to do when your grass starts growing again. I get a lot of questions about when should I put my cattle back out in the pasture. Well, according to uh, my observations while driving down the road, a lot of cattle are already back in the pasture. So how can you decide when you're deciding whether or not to buy back cattle, how many to, to buy, and when is the appropriate time to put them on the pasture? Okay, so first I want to talk a bit about inventorying what you have. Dr. Joe Pascal talked earlier about the wet soil survey, which is a great tool to go on and see what the production potential might be of your property. However, that production potential is assuming a lot of things, including uh, native species, that they're in um, a historic state, and a lot of times that's hard to find in South Texas. And also, they're assuming a good grazing management, so that you're, basically your property is in prime shape so that, that rainfall can give you the best possible yield, and that's not always the case. Sometimes we've had brush encroachment or a number of other issues that are causing us to have to reevaluate whether or not we're really hitting that production potential on our property. Uh, so how would you actually go out and estimate your forage? Second, we're going to look at goal setting and what is realistic. So uh, the land suitability. Should this land be for cattle? Should it maybe be reserved for wildlife? Where are you at your state and what are your operational goals? Uh, and then we're going to look at stocking rate. So how to take that amount of forage that you measured on your property and convert that into animal units. So let's get started. Uh, first, we'll look at what do we really have out on our property. So one way to do that, especially if you're not a fan of getting out of the truck when you're driving through your different pastures, is to simply set up a cage exposure. So all this is is a few T-posts with some cattle paneling around it. And the cattle are not allowed to graze inside. So when we tell you, you know, you can take 25% of your forage for your livestock, well, how much is that? Well, if you have a cage where you saw what your uh, maximum growth of your grasses were, then you can kind of estimate if a quarter of that has been taken just by sight. So that's definitely an option, and we have some publications available if you're interested on how to set up a cage exposure. So I talked briefly about uh, allocating 25% to livestock, but why is that? We used to have the rule, take half, leave half. So take half of your forage for your livestock and leave half as double. However, we've kind of started rethinking that rule, and we think more like 25% should be taken for livestock because we're not correctly accounting for the other animals that might be using that grass or insect damage to the grass or uh, trampling that might occur by your livestock. So take 25% of what forage you have available and go ahead and allocate that towards your livestock, leaving half there on the ground. Okay, so this picture should look uh, pretty familiar because I stole it from Dr. Foster. Uh, but we definitely want to encourage you to leave that 50% stubble for a number of reasons, including maintaining your healthy root system. It also provides wildlife cover when you leave some of that grass. It prevents the soil from eroding off when we get these rains. It reduces evaporation, so more of that rainfall that hits the ground is going into the ground for subsoil moisture. Uh, it definitely improves rain infiltration. If you've ever seen a rainfall simulator work, uh, those plants actually will direct that uh, rainfall into the ground so that subsoil moisture is there. It reduces the invasion of less desirable plant species. So we'll talk a little bit later about weeds, but bare ground equals weeds right now. So if you've got that stubble left there and it's covering up, a lot of times they say that the actual crown of the plant, of the grass plant, is only covering about 30% of the area if you were to throw a plot down. So when you leave some of that leaf material, that's covering a more a higher percentage of that area on your property. And also it maintains organic matter in the soil. So a certain component of that root system dies off every year, and that adds some more organic matter into our soils, which is great unless we have to add. So another way that you can measure, for, measure your forage is by flipping plots. Does anyone here enjoy flipping plots? No, probably not, but it's a really great tool and there's a way that you can take a photo when you're flipping your plots and eventually keep a book to where you can train your eye to know that on your property when you see a picture that looks like this, it equals this much pounds per acre. So eventually you're going to have your own records of your property that you'll be able to reference 
and then decide how many animal units you'll be able to run for that year. Okay, so when would you clip a plot? That's a really big question. What we say is you want to clip it after your growing season. So here in South Texas, typically, we get rains in the spring and the fall. So that would mean you would want to clip your plots more like June and June, July, and then again October, November. So given that we may or may not have rain later this year, it may be plausible that you could uh, measure your forage this March, and that might tell you how much you have all the way through this summer. Uh, because it's highly unlikely that we're going to get a whole lot of growth this summer unless uh, our weatherman tells us different later on. So, for example, even in 2011, when we received a really low amount of rainfall, we still had basically our rainfall come during this uh, June-July time and then again during the fall. So we can pretty much count on that uh, for when we should go out and measure our forage. Okay, so your supplies for clipping your plot are pretty simple. Uh, one thing you need is a plot frame like I have uh, here. The plot frame can be a number of different sizes. I typically use uh, a simple uh, three feet by three feet, so that's a, a nine foot squared plot. Uh, when you use a larger plot, it allows you to get a better idea of how, many, how much grass is there, whereas if you're using a smaller frame, you can imagine that that would be highly variable depending on whether that landed on some bare ground or on a huge bunch of grass. So uh, I like to use as big a plot as, as possible, but normally I go for the nine foot square. And in the supplemental material that I've provided for you today, it's on a sheet that outlines everything I'm talking about in this presentation. Uh, you'll see this chart. So it says here that if you have a nine foot square plot area, you'll need to make a plot uh, or a frame that is 36 inches long on each side. And I do that with just simple PVC pipe in the 90 degree corners. Pretty cheap, pretty simple. Um, if you're a welder, you could also weld yourself together a really nice uh, frame pretty quickly. And then this conversion factor, keep that in mind because we're going to reference back to that a little bit later. So first thing you need is a plot frame. Other things you might consider are a paper bag to put your forage that you clip into. Uh, you'll want um, to see if your wife is out of town so you can borrow her microwave. Um, so you can use that to dry out your plants. Another option is just to put them in the sun for uh, an amount of time that you feel like maybe dried them out. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about drying out in that procedure later. Uh, you'll also need some clippers. The only clippers I found in the back were these that are more made for shrubs. Um, I prefer the kind that are made more like scissors for clipping grass, if y'all are familiar with that. Um, you'll need a scale that can measure in ounces, and that could be like your little kitchen scale that a lot of people get when they're going to uh, monitor how much intake they're having on their feed. I have a little electronic scale, pretty cheap, uh, pretty easy to use and carry with me in the field. Um, you'll need paper to label your pictures, which we'll get to a camera, a calculator, a permanent marker. It'd be helpful if you had a map of your land, whether you use Web Soil Survey or you already have one, or Google Earth. So you'll kind of want to get a layout of what area you're trying to measure so you make sure that you're getting some plots taken uh, across the entire space. And then, of course, you'll need that conversion factor chart that I referenced earlier in this, on that piece of paper. Okay, so how to clip a plot. First, you want to locate representative areas. Pretty simple. Many of you are familiar with your property, so you probably know uh, some certain areas look similar and some might be different. So you may want to do a few plots in one area, and then if you know you're going to get different results in another area, measure that separately. Uh, the map can help you with laying those out. You can even mark so that the next year you sort of return to the same areas if you're interested in doing that. You could uh, randomly place your plot within this area. So uh, with such a big plot, if you've glued the corners good, you can kind of toss it out there. Um, I usually do that because if I'm going to clip, I'm going to make sure that it's not on some big sticker bush. So um, if you're a cheater like me, kind of toss it out there. I try to get a randomly placed plot within these different sections. Um, Move the grass either inside or outside of the plot perimeter. So basically, wherever that grass is rooted, you're going to want to make sure that you pull the leaves all, all the way inside, or if it's rooted outside, pull the leaves outside of the plot. Pretty simple, but after you throw it down, sometimes you really end up with a mess. Um, although this year, you're pretty blessed if you have that much grass that you have a mess when you throw your plot out. Um, so move your grass to inside or outside according to where it's rooted. 
And then you're going to label your picture with paper or dry erase boards. So I really, if you have a dry erase board, they're great for writing like plot number one, I'm in the Sneezo pasture, and the date. And then you just stick that down there, snap a picture. And the beauty of that is that later on you're going to be able to put that in a book with however many pounds per acre you came up with. Pretty simple project. And then eventually you're not going to have to clip every time. You're going to be able to say that looks approximately like it did this year and that was this many pounds per acre. So there you go. You don't even have to do the work. Okay, so uh, after you've labeled your picture and taken that, um, oh, you also might want to put a yardstick on there because the height, as we'll look at in some examples in a minute, really varies uh, the amount of poundage that you'll get. So you'll want to get a good idea of how high that grass was at the time as well. Okay, so you've got the picture. You label your bag with the corresponding plot number. So I put plot one, sneeze of pasture, and probably the date, just in case. Okay, so you'll clip your, your vegetation inside the plot, and I say all the way to the soil surface, because to try to clip a quarter of that plant mass is a little bit tricky. So what I do is I take the entire plant down to the ground and just shove it in my paper bag, and then you know you've got all of it, but you're only going to take how much for your livestock? 25%. Yep, good. Okay, so we've got all of that plot in this bag. All right. So uh, earlier this afternoon, or this was the other day, but uh, I went out, I took this plot, I actually went into the median out here on Highway 44. Um, I got yelled at for that, but that's the only place I saw any type of range plants, and it was barely a range plant. It was actually a bunch of KR blue stem, as you see in this picture. Uh, but I threw my plot out there. I clipped it, and I clipped it all the way to the ground. And as you saw in this black and white photo, sometimes when you take the photos before you print them out, you might want to change them to black and white because it's a little bit easier to see uh, the amount of mass in the picture because whether it's green or brown doesn't really matter as long as it's standing forage. Okay, so you clip it all the way to the ground. I have it all in my paper bag. And then what you do is you dry it, and I like to dry it in the microwave because I like instant gratification and it's pretty quick. Uh, but beware, what, what is grass? Yeah, it's fuel. So when you prescribe burn, you need fuel, so you need that grass. So keep in mind when you're uh, nuking it in your microwave that it could combust. And I've had seen it combust, and it's pretty scary. So uh, only dry for a little bit of time. Right now it's so dry that um, I would be tempted to only do half this amount of time. Uh, but you'll want to dry it, say, for 30 seconds. Put it on there and weigh it. Dry it again, put it on there and weigh it. And when your weight stays the same, as in it's not taking out any more moisture, then you know you've done the job. So you've dried this out. So another option would be to put this out in the sun and let it dry over time, or you can lay it out on a table in a dry room and let it dry. Uh, the problem with that sometimes is if you live closer to the coast, you know it's humid a lot of the times, and it takes a while to get something really dried out. So after you know how much your uh, bag weighs, you're going to want to take that forage. If you want to send it off for a forage sample, you can put that in a forage sampling bag and do so, or you can um, simply throw it out, take your bag and weigh it, because what? We have the bag, bag weight with that too, right? So you just subtract your bag weight from that total, and you have how much dry forage you have per that plot area. So that's when we go back to that conversion chart we talked about earlier. Pretty simple. Look for what the conversion values were. Let's see if I put a picture. Of course I didn't. Okay, so in ours it would be 302 times, say it was 10 ounces. So you do 302 times 10 ounces, and that equals your pounds per acre of dry forage. So very simple procedure. And we've got those pictures. So over time, we're going to have quite a collection of what our land can produce per acre, and we know how much forage we have. So that goes into this photo guide, which is another great uh, publication the Extension Service has if you're interested on how you would set up your photo guide. So here's an example of 10 inches of native grass. Remember, I said it really matters how high the grass is as well. So you'll want to stick a little yard stick in there. And this was equivalent. Uh, they did this in Carnes and Wilson County as a project. This is approximately 2,700 dry pounds per acre. Here's 20 inches of native grass, and that was up to 3,300 pounds per acre. So quite a difference depending on height. And then if you wanted to compare this to an improved forage, 
fine grass at the same height is about 500 pounds per acre higher in this case. So just to keep in mind, like Dr. Foster referenced, uh, there's quite a bit of difference in the nutritive value of a native grass versus an improved grass. So you might keep in mind that native grass, which is this bottom line there, has quite a bit lower crude protein in this example than, uh, say, the coastal Bermuda grass. Uh, so you might want to take that into consideration that you might need supplements to put in with your natives. Uh, it'll just depend on the time of the year, whether it's during the growing season or what, um, and what exactly is out there for your cattle to eat. However, having native grasses also allows you to diversify and run wildlife at the same time because native grasses, for the most part, create more diversity, which means more diversity for your wildlife, uh, which is a plus. So in goal setting, what is realistic? So we know how many pounds per acre we can uh, grow. So how do you know what your land is most suitable for? So you might want to go start with your original ranch goals. And this may have changed over time, or you may be adapting uh, as we run through these really difficult droughts. Your operation may have to adapt as well. So are you looking to just make a profit? Are you looking to meet your tax valuation? Are you looking for recreational purposes? Or more likely, you kind of have a combination of these uh, three major goals. But what exactly is your overall ranch goal? And then are you meeting that uh, by dividing your land up into what type of land use? So do you incorporate crops? Are you only interested in native landscapes? Uh, were you wanting to maybe try out some of the introduced pastures or the legumes that Dr. Foster referenced earlier? And then what species of interest are you particularly interested in? Because we know even when we talk about wildlife, uh, it depends on what wildlife species you're really managing for and what your uh, management goals are going to be. So when you have a healthy management system, you're really considering your livestock needs, your wildlife needs, and the plant needs, although they will never be in perfect balance. But the most important thing is your plant needs, because that's what drives both your wildlife and your livestock operations. So after you've nailed down what of these species you're interested in, you can proceed with how you want to manage your plants. So when we talk about a native plant diet composition, we usually talk about three different categories. One being the brush or the woody plants, or when we talk about uh, wildlife, a lot of times we refer to them as browse species. Uh, we also have our grasses or grass-like species or sedges. Uh, they have the long linear leaves. And then we have our forbs or our weeds, which are often referred to as, um, that are more your broadleaf plants or your wildflowers. And those are important components in the diet of uh, wildlife. So here's a typical cattle diet, which is about 80% grass, although they do have 12% forbs in their diet. It's probably arguable about whether they're actually trying to eat the forbs or whether their large bites just incorporate the forbs in native landscapes. Uh, but definitely cattle are more grass-driven species. Sheep are a little bit less reliant on grass and eat quite a bit more browse. And you can see just by their mouth structure that they would be more able to utilize the browse species that are really highly nutritious. And the same with goats. They actually uh, can rely a little bit more on browse species, although my dad always told me that goats could eat anything. So um, maybe that's not so true. When we look at a wildlife diet, uh, we talk about deer as being browse species. They mainly eat brush, uh, although forbs are also a large component of their diet, especially when they're in a forb or grass-dominated uh, area. And then we have our other big game species, our birds, the quail and turkey down here. Uh, which eat a high amount of seeds, which includes both grass seeds and forb seeds. So it's interesting that when you're utilizing your grasses for livestock, you might want to graze them before they seed out because they're actually um, not quite as stimmy. But when you're wanting to utilize them for wildlife purposes, a lot of times we need those seeds because that's what they're actually eating. Okay, and when we talk about um, exotic species, we have to consider if they're on our property, whether we want to manage for them or not, we really need to incorporate them into our decisions. Um, for instance, axis deer, which are a lot in the hill country, uh, native ranging, they eat quite a bit of grass, but also take advantage of browse. So when they compete with native white-tail deer, they can out-compete because not only do they have uh, young throughout the year, they also, when they run out of uh, grouse species that white tail deer utilize, they can switch over and take advantage of grass species. So they're a little bit more flexible. Nilgai antelope, which are free ranging down south, they eat quite a bit of grass. Now what species do you think is there at the bottom? Any guessers? Looks like 
Um, when there's uh, grass and forbs available, they eat quite a bit of forbs. When there's browse available, they eat quite a bit of browse. Uh, hogs. Hogs. That, that is a good guess, actually, but it's the white-tailed deer just utilizing different types of habitat. Uh, but yeah, hogs are probably fairly similar. Cattle, uh, actually, just to compare them to Nilgai antelope, Nilgai and cattle directly compete for resources, and you can see why. They have a lot of overlap in their diet. So if competition is, by definition, the simultaneous demand of two or more organisms for a limited uh, environmental resource, we obviously have more competition when there's less plant diversity or too many animals, which we probably have both of this spring because we've had this hard drought um, and we have a lot of animals to feed. And keep in mind that competition is only present when these resources are limited. So if you can provide a way um, or you can measure your forage resources and provide enough for each of your uh, species that you're managing for or might have on your property, then you're eliminating competition from um, your area, or at least decreasing it. So how do we actually calculate our stocking rate? After we figured out what our forage resource is, we know how many pounds of dry forage we have per acre. A lot of people ask me, why would I consider changing my stocking rate? We've owned this land for a long time. We've ran the same number of cattle, and um, we sometimes make a profit. Well, there's a lot of reasons that I would argue as to why you might consider reducing your stocking rate, as we've heard in the previous um, sessions, where they're suggesting that you run it more like a 75% stocking uh, percentage. One of these is because we simply have less grazable acres than we used to. It's a very general statement, but overall we have brush encroachment, which decreases the amount of forage we have available or had historically available. There's a documentation that way back in the day before the land was settled, people came in and when they rode their horses across these plains, they had grass up to their horses' bellies. Now, I don't know how many of you ride horses, but I have not seen grass up to a horse's belly before. Another range specialist, Dr. Baron Rector, said that's because now we have taller horses. But obviously he's kidding because we clearly have shorter grasses. We don't have the same um, savanna-like landscape that we read about in previous um, accounts. So we also have higher temperatures. It shows that over a long period we actually have as much or maybe more rainfall, although it's hard to believe this past year. But because of higher temperatures, we have more evaporation, and therefore we have less uh, rainfall that can be utilized for our plant resources. So this has decreased the amount of plant growth we have, and it also has, in a lot of ways, favored some brush species. So again, leading back to our brush encroachment. Also, as Dr. Foster alluded to, we have bigger cattle. So when they set up an animal unit, they made that for a 1,000-pound cow. Uh, or really, it's a 1,000-pound cow and calf unit. Um, but today, if you sold off any cows, you probably know that a lot of our cattle are reaching more up into the 1,200-pound range, and that means they're going to consume more forage, and we can actually run fewer of them. Also, we have these periodic droughts. I feel like a lot of people are hoping that these droughts have gone away, but any of you who have been in the business for some time know that they're going to be back in a few years. <coughs> They're not in the same severity, but they will be back. And so if you want to reduce your risk over a long term, you might want to look at reducing your stocking rate as a way to carry those cattle over and not have to sell off quite as many and then buy back at high prices. So when we talk about stocking rate, we're talking about the number of animals on a given land over a period of time. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, I stock at 1 to 10 or I stock at 1 to 20. And what they mean is they have one animal unit per 20 acres. Uh, hopefully they mean animal units. Sometimes they mean literally one cow per 20 acres. Um, and then a carrying capacity is a sustainable stocking rate. So I think we ought to focus a little bit more on carrying capacity and what that land can hold over a long-term period rather than what can be uh, utilized at that exact moment in time. So how many pounds of dry forage does a cow-calf need per day? Do you have any guesses? Okay. I I heard I heard I think I heard around twenty something. I heard fifteen. I heard thirty. Good. Okay. So it's about thirty pounds of dry forage per day. And where did I get that? 
Well, one animal unit, when it was set up as a 1,000-pound cow-calf unit, um, actually eats about 26 pounds of dry forage per day. So on the bottom, you'll see that if you equivalent a 1,200-pound cow with a calf, which is 1.2 animal units, it would actually need 20% more feed, which is really about 31 pounds per day, but we say about 30 pounds per day per animal uh, that we carry these days. So if you equivalent that into an animal month, that's 780 pounds of dry forage, or a year, 9,360 9, pounds of forage. Um, and again, this is all on a piece of paper that I've provided as a resource. Um, so when we talk about an animal unit equivalent, like 1.2, that's just the percent above or below this 1,000-pound uh, this cow-calf. So another table that uh, is on your, your handout is that the animal unit equivalents in dry daily forage. So to give you an idea, when we're talking about like a 300-pound calf, that is 0.3 animal units. When we talk about a 500-pound calf, that would be 0.5 animal units. Um, a horse actually is 1.25 animal units. Sheep is 0.20 and goats is 0.17. So uh, you could run about five sheep to one thousand pound cow. And I'd like to point out too, this is not taking into consideration forage quality. So you may have to increase this, uh, or you could possibly decrease this depending on the forage quality that you're you're providing your livestock. Okay, so now to look at wildlife. Since I introduced them earlier, a white-tailed deer is 0.13 animal units. So that's pretty interesting. And axis deer is 0.2, which would make sense because they eat more grass. Yep. And then uh, an elk is about 0.92, so it's almost equivalent to a uh, 1,000-pound cow. So to determine your grazable acres, uh, that's very important. When you look at your map of your land or you think about your land, how much is taken up by thick brush, uh, unproductive areas, inaccessible terrain, maybe roads, or maybe you have like your home there and you have some area designated as your yard. You want to take all of this out of the equation when you're determining what are the grazable acres for your property. So again, in drought, we're having more competition. So you might want to consider something like a, a stalker steer or a flexible grazing practice. So you might want to consider rotating your animals. You have a good opportunity to do that now that you're probably decreased to the number of livestock, the lowest number of livestock that you plan to decrease to. Um, you might want to consider, if you do have a good year, maintaining a lower number of cow calves and just bringing in stalker steers. That's always a great option for South Texas. Also, uh, like we talked about earlier, consider stocking at 75% just to decrease your risk, your financial risk. So here's a stocking rate example, and that form will actually uh, lead you through how to calculate your own stocking rate example after you determine your uh, pounds of dry forage per acre. So we've got three, about 3,000 dry pounds per acre in my example. Uh, and I decided that I had about 30 acres that were actually grazable acres. This equivalents to about 100,000 dry pounds per acre. Oh, sorry, 1,000 pounds of dry forage, period. Um, if we had five acres, oh, sorry, we had 30 acres total. And I thought, you know what, five of those acres have really been encroached by brush lately. And I'm not going to count that into my livestock grazing. I'm going to reserve that for wildlife. That took out six, about 16 or 17,000 pounds per acre from my total. Now, remember, we're only taking 25% of this for livestock, and that equivalents to about 21,000 pounds of forage. So again, if we divide this by 26 pounds per day, that will give us how many animal units, traditional animal units we can run, which is about 805 animal unit days. So if we divide that by 365, I'm really assuming that we're not going to get any forage growth in the fall. Now, if we do get forage growth in the fall, you could see how that would increase the amount of forage you have available, and you could increase your stocking rate. But this would give us about 2.2 animal units per year. And again, we're talking about a pretty small place. So if we have 1,200-pound cows that we're going to put on this property, that's about 1.2 animal units each. And we can run about two cow-calf pairs on this property. And looks like we're maybe going to have to borrow a bull from our neighbor. So if we wanted to run just stalker steers, uh, about 500 pounds stalker steer, and I said we ran them for about four months, uh, they're equivalent to half of an animal unit, and this equals 13 steers that we could run on this property. So you can see, after you get your dry pounds per um, acre, you're going to be able to extrapolate this out and think through your scenario and just kind of check, like, this is how many I've been running. 
and this is how many my forge is actually saying that I can run. So I think it would be a neat comparison. It might be eye-opening. It might actually help you kind of equivalent your uh, operation and help you uh, introduce less risk into your financial side. So to sum up, what management steps would I take when I'm looking at my land? First, I really encourage you to rethink your goal. Even if you've had your property for a number of years, think about what your goal and what your end product will be or what you'd like to see it be for your property. Inventory what you have. Determine your species of interest and their needs. Think about how you're going to allocate your resources. Really uh, study your land and see what place you want to put what. And then identify your weaknesses. Sometimes it's easier for us to be critical, but you know, when you're trying to decide what needs the most attention, sometimes uh, focusing on your weaknesses would be a good thing. And then critically evaluate your livestock operation, being your stocking intensity, and your other management, like your wildlife practices, and see uh, what you might want to adjust. Now this is ongoing. I would argue that number six is a continual process that we have to do, uh, if not every year, at least every other year. And that's all I have. Do I have time for questions? No, not really. Okay, well I'll answer questions at the uh, question break later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fagan.